is, is effective, then I would say yes, I agree with the statement. Um, but I think that there are multiple ways in which treatment takes place. Mr. Birch? I'm not familiar with the research specifically, but I think that you know the President and others have said that there is clearly a role for faith-based organizations and community-based organizations for those who want it uh, in this recovery. And so uh, we, we support that and we've, we've worked with that for a while. Okay. Mr. Chairman, I have a follow-up on that. The chair recognizes uh, Ms. Watson. You may proceed. I mentioned before, uh, my state of California started one of the largest treatment diversion programs by passing Proposition 36 by popular referendum. Unfortunately, Proposition 36 has not allowed us to significantly reduce the cost of our correction system because one quarter of the offenders uh, who have accepted the Proposition 30 since bargain never appeared for treatment and then only one-third completed it. So what do you think uh, California needs to do to improve the level of compliance with Prop 36? Should they incorporate any best practices from Hawaii's uh, opportunity, probation with uh, enforcement, that's the whole program, and given the severe budget crisis that we face in California, do you think the state uh, has the will and resources to successfully reform the Proposition 36 program? I guess I could answer that myself, but let me start with Dr. Tucker. Yeah, I think, yeah, I can't speak to the issue of the state's will, um, but with respect to uh, the, the parts of, of the program in California that, that don't seem to work effectively with respect to uh, the success rate. Um, I think it's important to, to look at um, what's happening in Hawaii, uh, certainly, um, but you, we can look other places as well. I think there are a number of, of um, opportunities around the country uh, to evaluate, to look at programs that, are, that have been effective and have had uh, high success rates, drug courts, certainly uh, the research, as we already mentioned, have been very successful. Um, in, in keeping the recidivism rates down, for example, over time. And so I think it's, it's worthwhile when we try these experiments uh, to, to, uh, to evaluate them as we go and, and if they're not working, to think about ways in which we can fix uh, the parts that, uh, that are not, not effective. My colleague mentioned uh, faith-based. Sadly, those who are hardly addicted don't end up in these uh, faith-based programs. These are the ones we would like to lure in, uh, but uh, it's been uh, something that is elusive thus far. I'd like to uh, ask Mr. Birch, uh, in your testimony, you stated that encounters with law enforcement play a critical role in whether or not people with mental illness or uh, co-occurring disorders such as mental illness and substance abuse are identified and directed to appropriate treatment instead of simply uh, cycling them in and out of our jails and prisons. So what's being done uh, on the federal level to encourage collaboration between the police and the mental health community? Well, thank you so much, uh, Congresswoman. That was a, a wonderful question. I'm pleased to be able to respond. Uh, through our Justice and Mental Health Collaboration Program, we've been working together with a number of different organizations, among them the International Association of Chiefs of Police, to begin to develop models that can be replicated around the country for crisis intervention to give law enforcement officers that are on the beat the tools, the tools that they need to be able to respond to the individuals that they encounter. Um, under the premise that um, t uh, having a person enter the justice system for, for treatment is simply not the best answer. And we can do better. And we can do better by giving law enforcement the tools they need to know how to recognize it and then how to divert it locally. And that training has been very successful. We've seen it be replicated not only in individual cities uh, and towns, but also individual states now have taken it on and replicated that training for their entire public safety response uh, core, if you will, not only law enforcement, but also EMTs, for example. And Georgia is one example of where that's happening. So there's great news to report in that. We're making a lot of progress. Well, maybe we need to improve the level of understanding of these particular treatments that seem to be effective. And we've got to some way 
get that knowledge out there. I'd like to go back, uh, uh, well, I'd like to go on, uh, Mr. Birch. Uh, you also stated that the Bureau of Justice Assistance is directing $57 million in funding for problem-solving courts in fiscal year 10 and has requested the same amount for fiscal year 11. And compared to traditional criminal justice proceedings, the costs are on average uh, $1,392 lower for drug court participants and can give to a savings of as much as $12,218 if recidivism, victimization, and other long-term social or societal costs are factored in as well. Given the savings that these alternative courts offer and their potential positive impact on individuals, families, and communities, it is critical that they are consistently available alternatives to incarceration for those who could benefit. So are you confident that the $57 million is enough to provide comprehensive access uh, to problem-solving courts for all who could benefit from them? And when you develop the request for $57 million uh, for FY11, did you take into account the increasing budget constraints of our states and local communities? Thank you, Congresswoman. Yes, uh, we, we are taking into account the economic situation that exists in the states and local jurisdictions in everything that we do. Um, in developing the, uh, the budget proposals that have been sent forward, uh, obviously the economic conditions and situation that we're in um, is, is something that we take, have to take into consideration. But we also look at the numbers of applications that we're receiving from local jurisdictions to replicate these programs. And in the last couple of years, we've been able to fund almost every responsive application that has come to us for drug courts or other kinds of problem-solving court programs. That does not mean that there, uh, that there, we could not use additional resources if, if appropriated to, to provide to additional communities, but it does indicate to us that we are providing the, the responsiveness that we need to provide on this and that we need to continue to work with communities to address these categorical exclusions that are addressing the people that are able to get in to these alternatives. That seems to be a big issue as it relates to capacity. Thank, thank you. you, and thank you for the extra time, Mr. Uh, Chair. Uh, gentleladies, welcome. The Chair recognizes Mr. Cummings. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, Chairman, thank you for being here today. Let me just ask you, um, you know, in, um, in Baltimore, we uh, have had a lot of success with our um, uh, drug court. Uh, as a matter of fact, it's probably proven to be uh, the most successful thing I've seen. And um, I have a theory on it. Uh, and I, first of all, I, I guess it's because the judge has um, a hatchet over the head of these folks and uh, they know that if they uh, mess up they're going to suffer the consequences and I, I think the other piece is that it's it's um, comprehensive helping them find jobs get drug treatment the whole bit and there are certain elements that seem to be a certain significance as alternatives to incarceration that is so that the um, the person the defendant most benefits not just society but the person benefits you know? what elements would you say seem to yield the um, you know that you, that you you've noticed that programs have that seem to yield the, the greatest benefit to, to, to the defendant. Both of you look like you lost. What's wrong? No, I was I, uh, I mean, uh, <laughs> actually maybe I was I'm wondering about myself. I thought maybe I was in the wrong <laughs> hearing or something. Let me let me take a uh, uh, and respond to that. Uh, okay. Uh, I think I think we're talking about providing to the extent that the person has a, a drug problem. We want to provide treatment is important, and that treatment has to be regular. Uh, we have to drug test folks. Uh, to make sure that they're, that they're staying clean. 
we have to, as they, if they're leaving uh, and returning to, to, um, uh, to our streets, to our communities, then we have to make sure that the, that, the, that, that treatment can be uh, continued uh, as part of their recovery. That's really critical. So, and, and then you mentioned already that the sort of what I call wraparound services, this notion that you don't want to leave these folks stranded. You want to make sure that they have something to help stand them up once they're, once they're back in the community. Uh, and those types of services have to do with jobs. They have to do, if we're talking about juveniles, it has to do with uh, making sure that they can cycle back into school uh, to the extent that they're not ready to, you know, that, that, that they haven't graduated. Um, but whatever it takes um, in terms of the, those wraparound services, that's what I think is important uh, to, to help stand these folks up. And, and that's, that's why I think drug courts who provide those kinds of services uh, and recognize that, uh, that they have a link to service providers that can, that can get support uh, these individuals once they're back in the community uh, really is an effective way in which to, uh, to proceed. I'm going to get to you in a minute, Mr. Birch, but I just want to throw this out. You know, I was sitting here listening to you all, and I was thinking to myself, alternatives may very well be a good, a good thing. Because I tell you, one of the things that has always bothered me as a lawyer and, um, and uh, just as a citizen is how somebody can go into prison and come out worse off than when they went in. In other words, um, the dirty little secret is that sometimes there are drugs floating around in the prisons. See, people don't like to talk about that, but that's serious. And so if you've got drugs in the prison, you, I mean, if you really think about it, if you don't have drugs in the prison, what does that mean? That means somebody's doing some serious cold turkey in because there's, that's, that's all they can do. But then, then when you see people come out of prison, still drugged up, and in some instances worse off than what they went in, that's an uncomfortable su subject, but it's real. And I live in the inner city of Baltimore, so I, I see that. And so I'm just, you know, it, it just kind of bothers me that sometimes we don't address those kind of issues. Y'all don't have to talk about it, but I'm just... It's something that people don't deal with, and it's real. And we have now seen in the Baltimore area more and more uh, indictments coming out for folks who work in prisons. And that's, I'm not knocking, uh, uh, you know, they'll have a headline tomorrow, Cummings knocked the uh, security guards. I'm not saying that. I'm just telling you what I've seen happen, and I think it's happening all over the country, a few bad apples are letting drugs flow into these prisons and it's very, very sad. And so then you say to yourself, well, maybe it is better that the person be on the outside to get the kind of treatment that they need or what have you. Um, but let me just, you can comment on that if you want, Mr. Birch. Oh, you want to comment, Mr. Uh, no, well, I, I was just, I, I, I mean, sorry, I agree Mr. with Mr. you that, that, uh, that that's a reality. And, um, and we support, you know, one of the things that, that we're trying to do here is break the cycle. And so we, we have to think comprehensively. And so we focus on drug use, we focus on crime, we focus on delinquency. We also have to focus on co incarceration inside the facilities. And so um, we have to, there has to be law enforcement even inside the facilities looking for drugs. Um, you know, drug, the drug trafficking happens inside as well as outside, uh, and so I, you know, I'm as disturbed as you are when those when when, when we recognize that that those conditions exist. Uh, but it's about additional law enforcement. Um, I think uh, both at the state level and the federal level, um, the institutions spend a lot of time focused on law enforcement inside the institutions, conducting inspections, um, uh, searches, um, drug testing, and so forth. Uh, and and those kinds of activities should should continue. Mr. Chairman, I see my time is up. Thank you. Uh, we have a vote on, but what we're going to do is uh, we're going to uh, give Mr. Davis an opportunity to answer his questions, uh, which will complete the first round. We will uh, recess uh, after Mr. Davis uh, for how many votes do we have? Two. Two. For, let's say, a half hour. And then we'll come back and we'll go to the second round and then we'll get to the next panel after that. I appreciate uh, everyone's indulgence here. We and the committee don't have control over the congressional schedule, uh, but we do want to make sure our committee work is uh, thorough and that we hear from everyone. Mr. Davis, uh, five minutes.
Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And let me just say that I am a real fan of uh, drug courts. Uh, have been for a long time. A good friend of mine, Eugene Pincham, uh, they used to call him all kind of things, the hanging judge. The, but uh, Pincham started years ago of uh, probably going outside the realm of what people expected a judge to do. And he just started directing individuals to do certain things. And he'd give them 60 days to do them and say, come back to my court. Let me see how you've made progress. If you haven't made any, I'm going to lock you up. Uh, I'm going to send you down to uh, <laughs> Menard or wherever. And of course, Judge Pincham died not very long ago. And he was recognized as one of the most effective judges uh, around. Let me ask, how high is the, is the Bureau on Coalition? I mean, uh, the development of community coalitions as a real way of reducing recidivism. I mean, I've seen some places like in uh, North Chicago, Illinois, and Waukegan that I consider to have a very excellent uh, coalition, community coalition. I've seen something in Bloomington, Illinois, where the Joyce Center has put together a coalition, the public defender, the state's attorney, the NAACP, the churches, the schools, everybody is a part of their action. How, how does the department or the bureau feel about that kind of activity? Thank you, Congressman Davis. I, I, I'm glad to hear you mention Bloomington, Illinois. In fact, we were involved in, in working with Bloomington, Illinois, and setting up that, uh, that group many years ago when they began an anti-gang initiative in that community. And that's where that group got started. I don't remember the name of the committee now, but it's been a very innovative group. I think at one point in time they even started their own sort of business to generate revenues for their programs, since it's just a great community and a great group of people. And I'm sure Mr. Tucker would like to talk about uh, the drug-free community support program that also uh, you know, encourages collaboration. But we're 100% we're behind that, and we're thankful to you and others for ensuring that the Second Chance Act also includes this notion as well and the task force requirements as a part of that program. And we see that you have to have that kind of broad-based community support behind every one of these initiatives. Is as we talked to folks in Virginia earlier this week, in fact, you can't just have one part of the system trying to make change. We've got to make change in every part of the justice system, from the front door to the back door and everything in between. All of those people have to be at the table and have to be committed to making change. And so we're 100 percent behind that. Well, thank you very much. And Mr. Tucker, let me just ask you, there is an expression of concern on the part of many people that there might be more focus in terms of the drug control policy shifting towards trying to prevent the spread of, 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 of meth and, and not as much focus put on, say, crack cocaine in central city areas. I happen to live in the inner city area of Chicago and have lived in big urban inner city all of my adult life. And uh, could you just address those two uh, concerns that, that, that are being expressed? Sure. I, I mean, I, I, mean I, I think I understand it. I think, uh, again, this is a very local kind of issue. Um, even when I, was, when I was on the streets as a cop, I mean, this was, this, these same kinds of questions would come up from neighborhood to neighborhood, community to community. Um, but the fact of the matter is, that, that it, depending on what community we're talking about, what state, what neighborhood, what county, or whatever, uh, you're going to have different types of, as it relates to drug trafficking, different types of, of, um, of illegal, uh, illicit substances. So as you point out, it could be meth in the Midwest, perhaps, as it came across the country, or it could be cocaine, could be heroin. It just depends. Um, and so the response, in terms of, is, is going to meet, uh, is going to be dictated by the threat. 
And so the way in which we do this is, uh, for example, I'm responsible for the high intensity drug trafficking areas. Uh, there are 28 of those around the country, uh, five along the southwest border and, uh, and in a number of other jurisdictions. And, and uh, those are task forces, federal, state and local law enforcement officers, constantly looking at gathering information, looking at the intelligence, and then looking at also developing the threat for that particular jurisdiction, what it, wherever it may be. So, so that's, I think, you know, just a function of uh, the, the response has to be a function of what the threat is and, um, and then, you, you know, the authorities, the law enforcement officials uh, take the necessary steps to try and, um, and intervene. Thank you, and thank you, Mr. Chairman. Now you're back. I thank uh, Mr. Davis. <clears throat> uh, committee members, we're going to, we'll be back here at approximately 4 o'clock. Uh, to resume uh, the second round of questions. Uh, the committee stands in recess until 4. Thank you.